to have not won a world cup or an Olympics. Um, it's just, I mean, for a player that's that good, it, it's just a shame to see that, that she wasn't able to, to get that done with her team. Well, thanks to you in 2008, but <laughs> Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lalas, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This show will be talking the U.S. Women's National Team Golden Girls with special guest Carly Lloyd, Emma Magic, the U.S. Men's National Team coaching search that just rolls on and on and on, uh, Mossy's big night out in Seattle, MLS women, question mark, Golden Goal, rating the summer of soccer, Philip Seymour Hoffman, League's Cup round of 16, and so much more. But first joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how you doing on this Monday, August 12th in the year 2024? I'm doing well. Very sad that these Olympics are over, but that performance by Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg already got me excited for LA 2028. Yeah, they uh, they did that. Where, what beach do you think that was? Where the uh, Chili Peppers and uh, 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 who was uh, who was the other girl uh, that was performing? Uh, was what, what do you think that was down at Venice? People were asking where they're going to do the the volleyball when it comes to uh, L.A. I would hope it's down in Manhattan Beach area, but it'll probably be up in uh, up in Venice. There w- there was a comfort food type of situation when it came to the Olympics. I would just get up and throw it on and watch, obviously athletics or gymnastics or soccer or basketball or break dancing or or anything else out there and now it's it's gone poof brigadoon it's uh it's uh it's gone um w- when last we saw you and spoke to you you were up there in uh, in Seattle how'd it go uh Seattle was great uh Sean Sullivan is actually still there now our intrepid producer uh, I am back in LA now with my parents. They came back with me uh, to spend a few days here. They're they're going back on Wednesday, which it, it's meant some great meals. The last couple of nights we went to this Italian place, Peponi, and then a steakhouse, Voltaire, both places in Brentwood. Wow. Both meals were phenomenal. Billie Eilish, that's the that's the young lady that was performing over there on uh, <laughs> one, one of the uh, lifeguard stations over there uh, with the Red Hot Chili Peppers and then the Tom Cruise thing coming through. Uh, you uh, you teased us last uh, episode that you were going to a, a Seattle game. Uh, you going to talk guess. about that later or you, or you want to talk about that now? No. Uh, later. You want to talk Boy, about you, Luke? You are right. just the, disrupting the rundown it's, here. I'm We've sorry. Got a, got I mean, a there's, a, there's place, a tease yeah. out there. I just wanted to make sure that we uh, we get it in here because sometimes we don't mention stuff off the top and people don't know and when they click off and go different places. So now they have to stay to hear your Seattle story. Uh, watching or reading anything interesting? Uh, last night I watched the premiere of season three of Industry which is an HBO show I very much like. I think it's poised for a breakout season. Uh, Kit Harrington of Game of Thrones fame is now part of the cast for this season. It's inherited that Sunday night HBO slot. Uh, so I'm excited about it. It's essentially the English succession. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's see. I went down a little uh, Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman, the late Philip Seymour Hoffman um, rabbit hole here watched two of his movies that I had not seen before. One, Owning Mahoney from back in 2003 about this Toronto bank employee that embezzles $10 million from his bank to fuel his incredible gambling addiction. And I think it's based on a, a, a true story. Uh, and then the other one was God's Pocket, which uh, was in 2014. Actually, I think he died a couple weeks after it came out. Uh, it's about a Philadelphia neighborhood it's actually called Devil's Pocket, I think. And just, you know, the crime and dysfunction and blight and relationships and all that kind of stuff. Just a, a wonderful actor uh, gone way too soon, but still has a, a great catalog of, of stuff. And I hadn't seen these. And he did a lot of independent movies that kind of came and went that you didn't necessarily have a lot of marketing behind it. So you didn't necessarily know about them, but still really, really good. Um, listen, should we light this candle, my friend? Let's do it. All right. Well, as we uh, mentioned off the top, the great Carly Lloyd is joining us. So let's get to Carly. 
All right, as promised, the great Carly Lloyd once again back here on the State of the Union pod. Thank you, Carly, for joining us. Uh, you are still due over there in uh, October, right, in terms of uh, having this child of yours. Am I correct? Yeah, a couple months left. Oh, Just, my uh, goodness. Taking oh a little break goodness. from the pool and, yeah, savoring the summer. Well, you look wonderful, uh, and we can't wait to uh, meet. Wait to meet this mon- bundle of joy. Now, uh, we worked this summer, and part of your angst and consternation over the summer, besides sitting next to me and working with me, was um, your uh, your ongoing saga with the pool at your house. Have we filled the pool in? Is it functioning right now? Does Carly Lloyd and all of the Lloyd family have the ability to use the pool? Let's get to the important things first. Yes, yes. The the pool was ready just in time for me to get home. I think July 11th, the water was in. I got back on the 15th. So um, we've been we've been soaking it up. The nieces, family, friends. We don't have much time left in this uh, you know summer on the East Coast. So it's been good though. Oh my goodness. Well, you're gonna have a wonderful rest of the summer and uh, the fall. Obviously, exciting things happening. So, all right, let's get into it. Uh, we come to you here uh, again on Monday, August 12th, and the United States back on top. Gold medal winners, winners when it comes to the women's team. What a difference a year makes, Carly. Can you put your finger on, other than just saying Emma Hayes, Emma Hayes, Emma Hayes, as to what the difference is? Uh, relative to a year ago when we were all lamenting and the sky was falling with the U.S. team historically bombing out of the World Cup. Now they come back a year later and make amends, if you will. They are back, baby. Gold medalists, the U.S. women's national team. Carly, how did this happen? Well, I think that, you know, people want to see this U.S. team stay on top and, you know, just constantly dominate. And that's the expectations But I also think that failure and uh, crashing out of a World Cup is very therapeutic for the program, for the the players, for um, just all of soccer fans around the globe. And, you know, I think that the World Cup was a complete disaster. There was not just one thing that was going wrong within that that group i mean there was a lot of things um you guys both know i mean in order to win any championship you've got to have all of the things there and you've got to have you know a little luck on your side as far as the path but um i think it was a a major reset for us soccer to go out and and find the best manager that they could and that meant waiting for emma to to finish up with chelsea And then, you know, the players, anytime you have a new coach come in, nobody is safe and you've got to prove yourself all over again. And I think that it humbled the players, it humbled the program. Um, And, you know, it it kind of, it reminds me a little bit of, of my experience in 2007 World Cup. We were pegged as, you know, winning that World Cup. We had all of the greats, you know, Abby, Wamba, Christine Lilly, still part of that team, Shannon Box. And it was a complete disaster. Um, And, you know, we came back uh, after Greg Ryan was fired. We had a new coach, Pia Sunhaga, and we went on to win gold in 2008. And and it was just a a reinvention of our team, Um, you know, the camaraderie and and the fight and the hunger and, and all of those things. But I think that you know, this was a good thing what happened in 2023. It, it needed to happen in order for this group to get back on top. And Carly, you just mentioned that uh, that gold medal in 2008, you beat Brazil 1-0 in that final and you scored the winner in extra time. Uh, you played uh, with some great defenders. It helped you win multiple gold medals and multiple World Cups. Uh, Emma Hayes said Naomi Gurma is the best defender she's ever seen. Uh, just from a U.S. perspective, where do you think she ranks? Could we make a case that she is the best defender the U.S. has ever produced? I think that, yeah, I I think that she's within top three easily. And I think she's she's the most complete um, defender that this team has had. I mean, she's really good on the ball. She's confident. I mean, she's so young, but she's so poised and Um, Her demeanor, you know, doesn't look like anything rattles her. I think it was interesting because they kept talking about the statistics of how many passes that, you know, she had and and her pass completion and all of those things. I mean, we do have to, you know, understand that, you know, were how many of those were penetrative passes? The teams did sit back. A couple teams did sit back on them a little bit and 
Um, you know, the back line had a, had a lot of time with the ball. So um, you didn't see that as much in the, the gold medal game against Brazil, but she was still effective as far as, you know, intercepting passes, um, sliding out and defending and tackling when she needed to, to do that. Um, but overall, I mean, just a, a really, really good, phenomenal player. And the fact that she's still young and, and going to develop, um, you know, says a lot about her, says a lot about the future, you know, in that central defense. But, you know, in 2008, we we needed our back line. The back line and Hope Solo were were played a large role in, in us winning that gold medal game. And, um, you know, you did you saw that in this gold medal game as well. Um, you know, the play was was OK from the U.S. First half, you know, Brazil was definitely a lot better. Second half, uh, U.S. came out, you know, and, and did um, play a bit better. But you saw that back line and Alyssa Nair just, you know, Alyssa Nair, too. We got to talk about her. I mean, she has she has reinvented herself. And, and I think she's entered this space um, where she can, you know, claim to be an all time great with what she's been doing lately. Let's get back to uh, to Emma Hayes. Uh, you know, I I love Emma Hayes. I think it was a wonderful and next to perfect type of hire for this U.S. Women's National Team. Um, as I said on uh, X a couple of days ago, she's not a magician. Okay, she's smart and she is clear and she is confident and she did ultimately what needed to be done. She got rid of the players that weren't good enough. She brought in players. Uh, you look at Corbin Albert and these types of uh, of players. We already mentioned Germa, who was there, was a, to be honest, was a star in the World Cup, one of the few stars that emerged from the World Cup, and she's just continued on and kicked uh, kicked on. And like I said, she brought in better players, and she made those existing players better. Even Alyssa Nair, who is at this point a legendary type of uh, level. But she also benefited from some good timing. Mal Swanson uh, returned, and she has fundamentally changed the way that this team plays like you mentioned, a step back in the World Cup and coming in after that historic failure. And like any coach and any team, a pathway through a tournament that at times could have been difficult if you were, if you had, if you were on the other side or in different groups and all that kind of stuff. So how much credit does Emma Hayes get? And is it as simple as just saying, well, Emma Hayes was the answer. And why couldn't that have been done without Emma Hayes a year ago in the world cup with Vodka and Tanoski and company. Yeah. And, and, and I liked your post because it, it was true. Everything that you said was, was spot on was true. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's hard for people to, to sometimes hear the truth. I think that a lot of people, a lot of people out there don't want to hear the truth. Don't want to hear exactly what's going on. But the reality is there were, Issues that were happening, you know, are starting to creep in as Vlaco got there. And you talk about timing, you know, Vlaco's timing was really, really tough timing. I mean, we've we we were in the midst of continuing a, an equal pay lawsuit, so everybody was on edge. You know, Vlaco and U.S. Soccer, and and you know, you kind of had more of the players spearheading a lot of decisions and. And all of that. And so if you didn't have a strong enough leader or strong enough person to come in and really set the tone, um, you know, it was just going to spiral out of control. And I think that, you know, not all the blame can go on Blacko. I think that it was just a combination of so many different things, uh, a combination of winning back two back to back World Cups, um, you know, at the at the end of the day, you know, you, you do have to be humbled in some fashion and, and pushed to continue to want to, to be successful and want to be dominant. But I think the timing of Emma coming in, um, was the perfect fit. She's the perfect person. Um, this group, you know, when I look at this group and, and this generation of players, they were needing a different type of coach to come in. You look at the the players like myself and and the players of the past. Our mentality um, was was self motivated. It, it was there. You didn't need a coach to to tell you to you know hey you got to dig deeper or um, the the pressure. You know we were able to deal with that pressure. I think every player was kind of prepared and and. The coaches came in and, and just kind of put the icing on the cake for us. Or now you're seeing this generation and this group of players who have needed to get back to, 
to focusing on winning number one and have needed the confidence and the calmness and demeanor that Emma has brought and then instilled in them. Because I know when I played for coaches that I could see were nervous, you know, it would put me a little bit on edge, but when you have a coach that comes in, that doesn't have any expectations, didn't even mention playing in, you know, gold medal, didn't even mention about this group being able to do it. She took that pressure off the group and allowed this group to just, you know, really find out more about themselves by digging deep. And she believed in them. And I think that, you know, the, the belief and kind of what she came in and did, of course, she structurally and tactically changed some things, but let's be honest in 10 games, you know, like you say, a magician, you're, you're not, you know, you're not Pep Guardiola changing, uh, you know, years worth of, of tactical play. This was more of a mindset, more of a psychological, um, you know, instilling that, that she brought to this team is what I, what I took from it. Um, just the, 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 the story that she shared about the ultra marathoner and, and the pain cave and, you know, not listening to everybody talk about the schedule of the Olympics, how tough it is with two days in between the fatigue. I mean, you had everybody talking about, you got to switch up the lineup. You've got to change, you know, rotate players, all of this stuff. Well, there's been plenty of us that have played every single minute in, in an Olympics and, and we've gotten through and we've made it. And she wanted the team to suffer and she wanted to have this group be able to get through something like that, gut through something like that. And then the build to 2027, I would imagine is going to be way more tactical um, with a lot of different, you know, changes and flair and and identity that she's going to be put in. But I think it was just that, you know, players refocused on winning players, hungry, a lot of players humbled, a lot of players, you know, were on the bench for majority of the year. Crystal Dunn, you look at her, didn't think she was going to start in this Olympics and then, you know, visited the bench throughout the year and she had a great tournament, um, you know, other players as well. So I just think that, you know, refocus of winning the confidence and and the belief is, is something that she um, instilled with this group. Uh, Carly, you've been upfront about the fact that towards the end of your national team career, you didn't always have the same outlook on the world as some of your teammates. So you have an interesting perspective on this Corbin Albert situation. She played great in the final, had the assist for the goal. The U.S. wins the gold medal. Do you think that's it now? Because Alexi has told me many times, the way athletes are wired, if you perform on the field and help me win, all is forgiven. Or is there still going to be a weird vibe surrounding this girl moving forward? Yeah, I don't know. And, and you know, that was a... That was an interesting move. I mean, we don't know the the extent of of Rose and if she was, you know, feeling a nagging injury. Um, but for Corbin to step in, she was probably one of the best players on the field that day, and uh, she played a huge role. and And that allowed Lindsey Fran to get up into that number ten position, which I do believe is is her best position. And I and I thought that that was a just the midfield looked a little bit more cohesive. Um, and then she played that perfectly weighted pass on for, for Mallory Swanson to score. But um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, you silence haters by doing something well on the field and, and performing, um, you know, we, I can't comment on what's been going on within the team, but it certainly looks like the team has embraced her when she scored her goal, everybody was hugging her and um seemed really excited. So I think that, you know, hopefully everybody can, can just move on. And, um, I would imagine that the group is talked about the issue and, and talked about what had happened. And I'm sure they're wanting to move past it as well. Yeah. I mean, let's hope so. Ultimately she did the job on the field and she did the job on the field, even with all the other stuff that was going on and the crap that she has been getting, uh, off the field. And so it says a lot about her mentality, uh, as a person and as a uh, player before we let you go, uh, Carly, uh, the bronze medal, uh, match Spain, zero Germany, one, obviously we've talked so much about Spain and what they are, uh, and what they have become and how important that they are. And you mentioned, you know, with what happened this summer with this women's national team, with the women, uh, U.S. women's national team, what could potentially happen going forward uh, with Emma and this uh, this team right now? Where are we when it comes to these teams? Because, you know, uh, Spain, it didn't end great for Spain in terms of losing their last two games here, but they are still a quality team. Do we still see the, quote, rest of the world catching up 
and 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 the U.S. right now, given what they did uh, did this summer, what teams are you looking for, either that exist right now or are coming up, that are going to vie for that position, that number one position going forward? Because ultimately, for me, this is still about winning the Women's World Cup. Ultimately, I think Emma Hayes is going to be judged on that. And this is this bodes well for the future. But as we said time and time again, there's a lot of other teams that are licking their chops here towards this next World Cup. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to discount the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics are great, but, you know, there there are only 12 teams and um, Germany was missing some key players. Uh, Spain, you know, seems to have the, the World Cup hangover with a lot of issues going on, although they had issues throughout the World Cup. We, we weren't sure how they were going to do, but it seemed like they won in spite of their coach and now they're, you know, not happy about the the current coach that they have. So I, I don't know what's going on inside of, of that locker room, but uh, they better get their act together because they still are uh, an unbelievable team. I think that they still are one of the top teams in the world. Um, you know, Germany, uh, you know, be interesting to see kind of with their players uh, that come back from injury. Um, but I think, you know, I was really I was really impressed with Brazil. Now, you know, Mossy, I don't know how you feel about uh, the woman's side with Brazil. I, I think that they can never seem to get it done when it matters. And they had a fantastic tournament, um, you know, just growing and growing with each game. I, I just don't think that they had enough against the U.S. And so, you know, is this coach going to kind of build that into them, build that belief into them? I think if they can kind of get that mental part to their game with how they're currently playing um they're going to be they're going to be a top team but um you know i think you know still the the likes of england and um you know i said spain germany you know are still going to be top contenders um even colombia uh, you know coming up so i think that the world cup in 2027 is that is like you said going to be the ultimate test for emma and this team and remember, that World Cup is in Brazil, so I'm hoping the home cooking will help us. But you're right. Uh, Brazil has a real mental hurdle they have to get over in these finals. Carly, before we let you that, go... That I, mental hurdle is what? Marta? They have to... <laughs> <laughs> that might help. Uh, First but, of all, can we, talk about, can we talk about Marta? I mean, just an incredible player, which he's done for the, for the game on and off the field. But to have not won a World Cup or an Olympics, um, it's just... I mean, for a player that's that good, it, it's just a shame to see that that she wasn't able to to get that done with her team. Well, thanks to you in 2008. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Carly, I do want to ask you a U.S. men's question because after the Copa America debacle, you said on our air you thought the players were too chummy with Greg Berhalter, that uh, you referenced the fact that you hated some of your coaches and maybe the U.S. needed that dynamic on the men's side. And now you have Tyler Adams, a player who fought for Greg Berhalter to be rehired, coming out and saying, yeah, I think we need a ruthless guy now that's going to kick our ass a little bit. So what did you make of those comments? Do you feel like that validated what you were saying during the summer? Yeah, I was I was chuckling at that because I'm like, what, how did we go from, you know, you'd run through a brick wall for this guy and, you know, you you get to talk about things other than soccer and, and all these things. And I think that there's a, there's a fine line. There's a fine balance. I mean, Emma clearly has been wanting to, you know, treat people as human beings with the U S women's national team and get to know players and, and all of those things. And, you know, I would imagine she has a good balance of, of that, but also pushing the players and, I mean, yeah, I was I was shocked to hear that, but that's sort of, you know, and I didn't even get any inside info to that or anything. It just was the vibe that I had where I just didn't think that these players were being pushed and I thought it was too comfortable. And I think that they sort of need a Emma-esque, no BS coach that comes in on their side and holds everybody accountable pushes everybody um, and, and kind of resets, you know, everything. And, and like Alexi, you've been saying all along, you know, you, you want somebody to come in to make everybody excited to watch this team. And, and that is exactly what Emma's done. I think everybody watching this U S team throughout the, the Olympics um, just recently, you know, people have fell in love or fell back in love with the team and we need that on the men's side. So I think, you know, U S soccer, made a great decision with Emma. I would imagine that they're going to make a great decision on the men's side. 
but these players should not be comfortable. And uh, I was, you know, yeah, I was, I was chuckling at that, that interview. Spot on Carly. Uh, Emma has come in and everything that the team wasn't last summer that you and I, you know, everybody uh, were talking about last summer. It is the opposite in terms of obviously the results on the field, but the way in which those results happen, the players, the personalities, the likability, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Emma has come in and done the things needed in order to get this team where they are, not just standing on the podium, but people actually coming in to that tent and wanting to see it. Listen, you got much more big, um, much bigger and better things to worry about. You got a wonderful working pool over there. You have a wonderful bundle of joy coming here in eh, a couple of months here. Have a wonderful rest of the summer. Thank you so much for coming on the show as always. Um, how the chicks doing, by the way, everybody okay over there with your, uh, your chickens out there? Uh, yeah, hopefully they haven't been attacked by a hawk. They've been, they've been free, free ranging right now. So I'll, wow. I'll go check out in the yeah. wilds, out in the wilds of Jersey. All right. Thank you, Jersey girl. Thank you, Carly Lloyd. We'll talk to you again, uh, and head back over to that pool. See ya. Hey, always a pleasure. Uh, Lex, uh, picking up where we left off with Carly, I asked her about the U.S. men's coaching search. Remember last week and all the stories were that Pellegrino Matarazzo was going to get the job. That turned out to not be the case. And now this past weekend, Mauricio Pochettino emerged as the favorite. Paul Tenorio reported it. Doug McIntyre is hearing the same as well. Uh, Pochettino, obviously a massive name, no international coaching experience, but he's managed the likes of Tottenham, PSG, and Chelsea. This jives with a previous article Doug McIntyre wrote that Matt Crocker was leaning towards a big name foreigner. Uh, what do you think? If it happened to be Pochettino, how would that hit you? Fine. Great. Do it. Get it done. If, uh, if that's what Matt Crocker believes uh, needs to be done, I, I don't disagree with it. Like you said, he has yet to experience the international game, uh, he and Pochettino as a coach. It certainly checks the box of a sexy name. Uh, and I think that, to your point, it, it's not that he has to do something like that, but I think there is a lot of expectation that this hire is going to do something that we haven't seen before. And I do think that this would satisfy that. I think the salary that he commands, his background and I'm, you know, like, I'm not saying that Jurgen Klinsmann wasn't a high profile type of signing but what Pochettino has done I think he has garnered praise with his obviously his club um, his club resume that a lot of people would say yeah that's interesting yeah I'm in yeah that's exciting that yeah that is that is sexy uh, it brings up you know a question that I've been asked multiple times right now is you know do we do we just want it done or do we do, do we want it done right? I think everybody would say you want it done right, but how long is too long? Because this continues to go. And we had talked earlier in, in uh, previous episodes of State that you had to kind of get through the Olympics. Now the Olympics are done. We're coming into the, the fall season and certainly with the U.S. Uh, with games. And, you know, someone was asking me the other day, at what point does not having a U.S. men's national team coach become a problem? And my answer is the same that has, that has always been. And it is, I think, unique to where we sit right now, less than two years out from 2026. Every day that there is a vacancy is a day that is lost that could, if somebody had been appointed, that could have been used to make the 2026 World Cup more successful and more successful both on and off the field. The World Cup now starts in what? Like, we, as we sit here today, 667, 68 days from now. And I do feel that the coach of the U.S. men's national team leading into this 2026 World Cup that, as we all know, we are hosting here along with our friends from the North Canada and our friends to the South Mexico, I do think that this in particular this job is unique. You are coaching the home team. You are coaching America. And you need to be an inspirational force for this team. Yes, for this tournament. Yes, for this country. And yes, for the future of the game in the United States. And so for the next now less than two years, this person's job, if it's Pochettino or anybody else, is to not only get us the wins and provide the X's and O's on the field, but also to excite us and to inspire us in the same way that we just heard Carly Lloyd talking about what Emma Hayes has done. 
You need somebody that is going to do that. And yes, that is part of the job description as far as I'm concerned. It's not just about winning. Yes, winning is a huge component of it. But in this, in this unique moment, in this unique situation, you have to be that proverbial pioneer. You have to be the ambassador. You have to be spreading the gospel. And that's somebody that I want. Can Pochettino do that? Maybe. Maybe in a different way. His English isn't great. But I do think he can be that inspirational type of person that everyone says, you know what? I was really down. And after that incredible failure that happened this summer in Copa America, I was not positive about the direction that it's heading. And like that, you can change it, not just with your results on the field, but also with your attitude that you bring in. What's interesting about Pochettino is whenever we bring up these big name foreign coaches, uh, you always uh, raise the question, it's a fair one, would their coaching skills translate to a totally different context? Because yep. if you're used to coaching super clubs and how are you going to handle coaching the U.S. national team and oftentimes having less talent than the opposition, Pochettino did manage Espanyol and Southampton and did a pretty good job in both those places. And even Tottenham, to take them to a Champions League final and to finish second in the Premier League was considered punching above their weight, given the fact that they spent comparatively less than the other big teams in England. So there are some things on his resume that you could argue are analogous to coaching the U.S. men's national team. Yeah, I do think that you need somebody, if they are a big name, if they are a sexy name, that has the, the ability, whether they've proven it in the past or you just believe that they have the ability, to do more with less. And to your point, at least he can point to some instances where he has done that. Uh, incidentally, uh, he played for Marcelo Bielsa at Newell's Old Boys in the early 90s, helped them get to a Libertadores final. Uh, Tata Martino was also a player on those teams. So he, Pochettino sometimes does get included in the Bielsa tree, but he's veered off in so many directions over the years that I don't think anybody looks at him still as a Bielsa disciple. I mentioned he has no international experience as a coach. As a player, he did play for Argentina in the 2002 World Cup. He actually is the one who fouled Michael Owen in the box. David Beckham converted the penalty. England famously beat Argentina 1-0 in that World Cup. Pochettino to this day thinks that Owen dived on that play. It shouldn't have been a penalty. But So he has experienced the highest level of the international game, at least as a player. All right. I mean... Do it. Just <laughs> You're I know ready that to get this over. I with. am. I know. And I, and, I, and and I, I recognize that there are people that are listening. There are people that are watching that are saying, hey, let's make sure that we get this right because it's so important because of all the things that he just told you about. But there is also a part of me and a big part of me that just says, yeah, but we're wasting time and you're never going to get the perfect candidate. You're never going to get someone that checks every single box, either because that person at that moment is not available or what is more likely the reality is that person doesn't exist no matter who it is. All right. There are always going to be, there are always going to be problems, but at some point do it and they, they will do it. And I hope, I hope that we don't go past a September window, uh, international window and, and not have a coach. That's fair. Uh, lastly, I do want to put a ribbon on men's soccer at the Olympics and the okay. Olympics as a whole. Morocco hammered Egypt 6-0 in the bronze medal game. Rahimi scored twice. He captured the golden boot with eight goals. Um, and then as far as the final, it was an absolute thriller. Uh, Spain beat France 5-3 in extra time. Fermin Lopez scored twice in regulation. Spain led 3-1. France came storming back. Mateta equalized from the penalty spot in stoppage time. But then Camelo scored twice in extra time, including one assisted by the goalkeeper with an incredible throw. Uh, so Spain take it. They become the first European nation to win the men's gold medal since they won it on home soil in 1992. They complete this dream summer, winning the Euros and the Olympics. And remember, last summer, we had this on our air. They won the UEFA Nations League, beating Croatia on penalties in the final. So the last 14 months or so, it's been a trophy-winning orgy for Spain. I have a couple of thoughts on this final, but I'll let you go first. What did you make of it? I think it's hard to argue that the best team didn't win, uh, the best team in the tournament, and the best team ultimately in this game, um, despite... The, the efforts from France and they made it an incredibly entertaining and exciting, uh, exciting game. Um, yeah. I mean, they, I mean, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, uh, the goal that Spain scored from the long throw out of the back. And it was interesting because Tim Howard was doing the game and we were, well, if you're, if you know anything about history in terms of Tim Howard outletting and doing all this kind of, stuff, Brad Friedel used to love to do the long throw into space because you can control it much more with your, 
arm. Well, some goal, 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 goalkeepers can. In the modern goalkeeping era, a lot of that side type of uh, volley that goalkeepers do to spring people. But I loved the fact that Spain scored this type of goal because it it runs counter to all the tiki tock <laughs> type of thing that we are talking about. You cannot get any more direct and using your hands, which is which is wonderful. But I think what it does is highlight how much Spain has evolved and ultimately, I don't want to use the word pragmatic, but they have so many different facets to their game and they can play in so many different ways, which makes them unpredictable and also makes them incredibly dangerous if you're coming up against them. So congratulations to Spain. I thought in general, the tournament was good. I thought there was some, some wonderful teams, wonderful scenes, wonderful individual plays. And, you know, you have Morocco and Egypt showing up in uh, in third and fourth place in a tournament like that. So I thought uh, that was uh, ultimately good for for an Olympic tournament that at times from a men's side gets looked down on. And I understand that, too. A couple of things. Although he did not capture the gold medal, Thierry Henry generally earned praise in the French media for his work in this tournament. And there's an interesting dynamic there because the Champs is signed until 2026. Presumably he will leave after that. And I think both Zidane and Thierry Henry want that job. So France might have to decide between two legends for who succeeds uh, Didier Deschamps. And if your choice was between Thierry Henry and uh, Zinedine Zidane, who are, you, who are you picking? I would lean Zinedine Zidane. Lean? Well, you could argue Thierry Henry now has uh, something international on his resume, coaching-wise, while Zidane doesn't. I mean, for Zidane, you're reaching back to Champions League titles won with Real Madrid several years back now. That's true. He's been on this sabbatical. So uh, we'll see if either of them do anything coaching-wise between now and 26 to bolster their claim. But it's just something to keep an eye on. Yeah. The other thing is, um, with Spain, it continues to fascinate me. Um, Folks in Madrid are much more hyper-passionate about the Spanish national team. In Barcelona, not so much. Half the people in Barcelona don't even consider themselves Spanish. And yet Barcelona is the club that has serviced the Spanish national team much more in recent years, including obviously during that golden age when they won the Euros in 8 and 12 and the World Cup in 10. They had seven or eight starters on those teams that were Barcelona players. And then you fast forward to these Olympics, seven of the 11 starters in the final were La Masia products, including Fermin Lopez, who was their big star in this tournament, scored six goals. We're coming off a of Euros where La Mina Mal was a revelation. So it's just funny to me that Barcelona, where they care less about the Spanish national team, they're actually the ones that, based on the players on the field should have a much greater identification with it. Yeah, I feel horrible for him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations to everybody uh, that did well, men's, women's, when it comes to the uh, the Olympics. Uh, in general, successful Olympics when it comes to soccer? Absolutely. And, you know, I mentioned France lost the gold medal game in the men's soccer uh, tournament. They also lost the gold medal games to the U.S. in both the men's and women's basketball. Uh, those were some great games. And that meant that the U.S. finished tied with China overall, 40 gold medals. But because the U.S. won more overall medals, the U.S. won the Olympics. That must have been satisfying for you, validating your claim that this is the greatest country in the world. Not that I needed validation, but it's certainly evident in the medal tally. Although... <laughs> That there are athletes, Olympians, that can win multiple medals because they compete in multiple events and in sports that have multiple events, as opposed to a basketball player or a soccer player where you have, I guess, one event and you can, you, no matter how awesome you are as an Olympian, as a soccer player, you can only win one medal as opposed to a swimmer or a gymnast or a track and field athlete. So that's that's a little strange. When they when they have this, you know, they're covered in in medals. It's comparing apples to oranges because a soccer player can't do that. Steph Curry or Magic Johnson, who's the greatest point guard of all time? Who, uh, who's Steph Curry? He plays for whom? <laughs> Which uh, he hit an incredible shot to ice the gold medal game and was phenomenal throughout. Uh, he is the uh, star no, player for the Golden the, State uh, Warriors. And that, that's medals. now ignited this uh, oh, really? debate in basketball circles about who is the greatest point guard. I'll talk to Jack about this after the pot. I'm sure I mean, he has opinions. It's on magic. It. And, and well, if you talk to Jack, I mean, you, you would go with the Michigan guy. I know it's a Michigan State guy, right? Uh, Correct. Yeah, boy, very good. Yeah, good pull. There. Nailed it. Nailed it, people. Magic. Spartan. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we got some leaks. Come back.
All right, welcome back. We got the uh, League's Cup, which continues on, and we're down to the nitty-gritty here in terms of the round of 16. Got a bunch of games tonight. Again, we were recording here on Monday, so a bunch of League's Cup games tonight. Most feature uh, you, uh, MLS teams versus Liga MX teams, but there are also MLS versus MLS and Liga MX versus Liga MX uh, games. Where do you want to start here, Mossy, in terms of a look back before we look forward? Yeah, so the round of 32 is in the books. Uh, Round of 16, we have 10 MLS teams, 6 League MX. Four of the eight matches are MLS versus League MX. You have Seattle Pumas, which is a rematch of the 2022 CCL final. You have Tigres NYCFC at Red Bull Arena. You have Toluca, Colorado. And Club America St. Louis, which is actually being played here in Los Angeles at Dignity Health Sports Park. Uh, Let's go there first with the MLS versus League MX matchups. And also in general, we talked about how the group stage was a bit tedious, but we thought that once you got into the knockout rounds, people would become more invested in this competition. Has that happened with you? And how excited are you for this next set of MLS versus League MX? Yeah, it's much clearer (laughs) <laughs> and obviously simpler. <laughs> uh, you had talked about the, you know, the group situation and uh, you know, as smart as you are, how at times confusing. And let's be honest, the confusion is relative to the amount of effort that we actually want to spend <laughs> figuring it out. So we could certainly could, but we like to be spoon fed at different times. So yeah, it's much clearer as to what's, uh, what's happening now. And I'm interested. I'm interested to see what these teams uh, look like uh, in these types of situations as it goes on. And ultimately, there's going to be somebody standing there with a you know, a piece of silverware and a trophy and all that comes with that. So yeah, uh, I'm excited. Like I said, uh, we are recording on the 12th game tonight and then a bunch of games on the 13th. Yeah, and then we have one all league MX matchup, Cruz Azul Mazatlan, and three delicious all MLS matchups. Inter Miami, Columbus, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and LAFC San Jose. Inter Miami, Columbus. How about that matchup? And that's in Columbus, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going to be that's going to be interesting. And at some point, Messi's going to start playing soccer again, right? Could it possibly be that night? Although they continue to thrive without him. They beat Toronto 4-3 yep. in the round of 32. Great game. Rojas, who's been an incredible addition with two goals. Suarez got one as well. Jordi Alba with four assists. So uh, Inter Miami, no Messi, no problem. Yeah, no Messi, no problem. But Columbus is a problem for anybody that they come up uh, come up against. Cincy Philly, I think that's an interesting one in Cincinnati, uh, and then a battle in California with Los Angeles and the uh, Quakes. Uh, programming note: I will be attending that game. Wait, LAFC wait. San Jose, yes, Tuesday night. I've I've caught the League's Cup bug, as, as you mentioned at the very top of the show. I was in Seattle last week. I did go uh, Thursday night to the Seattle Sounders LA Galaxy game. Seattle won three one. And let me say this to the good folks at Apple because they do a great job covering this tournament. But when you spot a celebrity in the stands mm-hmm. and you show them, you, you should font that person. <laughs> uh, so that, that was one interesting decision they made on Thursday night. If the good folks in our control room haven't figured it out, that's your cue. Yes, uh, exactly. So there's the picture. And uh, <laughs> evidently, the proceedings on the field uh, were, were not to your liking or you were bored because I see you on your phone in this picture here. And to be fair, when it comes to the director up there, given the sparse attendance, shall we say, at the game. There's only a certain amount of people that they actually can put on camera. Yeah, I do want to defend myself. It was halftime, so okay. I was looking out of my phone. <laughs> and yeah, they should have done, you know, Ambie's nominated podcaster, soccer savant, right. uh, Alexi Lawless's guiding light, researcher, writer extraordinaire. <laughs> there are different ways it could have gone there if they had fonted David How was Mossy, the experience, but- though? How was it? Well, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a good game. I, I liked it. But I, I do have to say, we'll go there next. I was startled at how small the crowd was. And this has become a big talking point. We've seen other games, too. I just mentioned Inter Miami, Toronto. There were only 10,000 people in the stands. Uh, so critics of the uh, League's Cup are having a field day with that and posting these images of these empty stadiums. And then there are uh, MLS defenders that are saying, no, wait a minute, you're cherry picking certain games. There are others where the attendance has been just fine. So it's more hit or miss. Uh, nevertheless, this has become a big topic. What do you make of it? You know, for people that want a visual representation of their anger slash insecurity relative to what MLS is, what MLS isn't, what MLS is going to be, to people out there that want to use this as a moment to get on their soapbox and tell everybody what should be done and all the horrible things that are happening, then yeah, they're going to put up a picture of a relatively empty stadium and a a league's cup game that uh, is sparsely attended. And then people on the other side are going to say, well, this is some of the reasons why, Uh, whether it's literally people didn't know about it until a couple of days before, 
price of tickets, uh, timing, all that, all that kind of stuff. Or they're also going to say, hey, but look at all these huge crowds that they, they, they did have. So ultimately, from an MLS perspective, it's going to be in totality. Was this successful or wasn't it? Not there was a sparsely attended game here or sparsely attended game there. So, you know, use it in the way that you see fit. And if you feel good about yourself after it, go for it. But you can make a case both ways from a visual perspective, and there is plenty of fodder out there. So MLS, we know uh, the decision to create this uh, League's Cup competition and to prioritize it over U.S. Open Cup has drawn a lot of criticism, become very controversial. Uh, there are some reports uh, uh, this past weekend that MLS might be taking another controversial decision, uh, which is to start up a new women's league after the 2027 World Cup to essentially compete with the NWSL, probably with an eye towards them eventually merging. Keep in mind, I have not seen this confirmed anywhere or really any reputable source report this, but uh, this did pop up on some website over the weekend. Sean Sullivan sent it to us. Um, what, what do you make of this story? So you're saying that, well, let me get this right, Scarves and Spikes over there is not a reputable website when it comes to reporting the news and the scuttlebutt of uh, American soccer? I guess that is what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So look, uh, who, how, who, this, this person on their couch tweeting out stuff and writing stories here. Um, <laughs> Got everybody all up in arms and screaming and yelling, and I kind of, I kind of love it because it, it's a, it's a representation of where we are right now. And yes, anybody with a microphone, anybody with a computer, can say whatever they want. They can type whatever they want, and they can put it out there into the ether, and it may or may not get picked up. When it comes to something like this, because everybody has a platform, because everybody has a microphone. Everything out there, you know, can resonate. Doesn't all resonate, but it can resonate. And so something like this coming out with, you know, some of the specifics of it were <laughs> pretty incredible. And I should probably quote this person over there on scarves and spikes. This would be coming from Caleb Ewing. I don't know if, if that's correct, but he or she, uh, you know, did this story. Now, on the surface... MLS looking at um, a potential what would be expansion of the business. They are in the business of professional soccer. Looking at the expansion of the business relative to the women's game, which we know has increased and improved, that on the surface is, is not a crazy type of thing to say. But some of the specifics as to what, what is happening here, I guarantee you right now that MLS headquarters is fielding questions from, I'm sure, some reputable people out there about if this is correct or not. And they're spending time and resources try, trying to deal with something, uh, something like this. It, it, do, it doesn't make sense from a couple of different reasons. Number one, there are, are plenty of MLS owners that are also owners over there in NWSL. And so they would be, including Adrian Hanauer, by the way, <laughs> up there in Seattle, who is now part of the ecosystem and part of the NWSL uh, system going forward. And you have USL, which is coming in with the league. So if, if this is actually a part of MLS's plan, okay. I mean, I, I don't think that it necessarily is right now, but it's not beyond the pale that they would look and kick the tires. Even back in the day when I was working in front offices, we talked about having a women's team as part of the portfolio. And that, you know, that's just smart. Back then, it didn't make sense. And it was money that I, don't, I, I think we judged was not prudent to be spending. And let's be honest, to be losing at that time. As the women's game has grown, and obviously as professional women's soccer has grown, especially in the form of NWSL, I think it at, at a certain point does make sense to look at it. But I don't think by any stretch of the imagination that it is far down the line that these uh, folks over there at uh, Scarves and Spikes in Atlanta would have us believe, given this article right now. If MLS has any sense of humor, they would create a women's league with ProRel. Right? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> uh, but Lex, uh, on the topic of people getting worked up and yelling at each other, I'm going to go off rundown here uh, because right. this caught my attention this past week. And did you see Wrexham played their first League One game? They beat Wycombe 3-2. And there are folks like uh, good friends at World Soccer Talk that can't get enough of this Wrexham story. So they were celebrating it. And both Leander Sherlock and, and Max Bretos went off. I'm so sick of this Wrexham nonsense. Move on from these guys. And it sparked this whole back and forth between Bretos and World Soccer Talk on X. It was delightful. Oh, I, had, I did not see. It. Well, first off, no, I did not see the Wrexham game or the Wrexham score because it doesn't come on my radar. I don't, I don't, I don't care. And if it does, it's relative to the show and relative to the high profile owners or something like that. But we've talked about, you know, the, the insanity when it comes to, to Wrexham here and the amount of money that they are spe spending. And then people screaming and yelling at me about merit and meritocracy and all that kind of stuff. There is a, a new Deadpool movie out that's raking in lots of money, right? Did I see that? That's, this is outside that's the owner my of Wrexham, house. right? Yeah. So yeah, yes. so he's going to be doing well. Uh, anything more on that? <laughs> um, no, and I just want to say, uh, and then uh, we had a community shield this past weekend. City, Manchester United finished 1 1. Garnacho and Bernardo Silva with the goal. City won on penalties. So the English uh, season is off and running. This Wednesday, we have Real Madrid Atalanta, the UEFA, uh, UEFA Super Cup, and Mbappe's debut. So another European club season is upon us. And EP EPL starts, uh, the Premier, Premier League starts this weekend, right? Correct. On Friday, Manchester United okay. Fulham. So Wednesday, I'm going to go through all the teams. And, you know, as we say here on the State of the Union, we look at things through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. I'm going to give you reasons, either current reasons or past reasons, why this team, whatever particular team it is that I'm talking about, you may like them. So I'll, I'll, there's a little teaser for you on Wednesday. I'll give you a little one for each different team. Some are probably going to have to go deep. Some not so deep when it comes to the, the EPL teams that are uh, playing this year. And I'm not going to go into... You know, second division, third division, anything like that. Just, just the uh, the Premier League teams. So I'll give that on Wednesday. Anything else, my friend? That's it. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, it's time for Ask Alexia and my one for the road. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexia, that part of the show where you send in your comments, questions, and concerns. Keep in mind that our uh, State of the Union podcast uh, handle out there on all the social media platforms is S O T U with Alexi, and use that hashtag Ask Alexi, or you can call into our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657 549 2297. 657 549 2297. What do the folks want to know today, Mossy? Uh, first up, we have a voicemail. Let's take a listen. Hi, this is Amy calling from Stowe, Vermont, with a quick question. After watching the U.S. women play their second overtime in this Olympics, I have to ask, why do we not play golden goal in these major tournaments? It doesn't seem to make any sense. Any background history logic that you could explain would be greatly appreciated. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Amy from Vermont. Uh, thanks for calling in on the uh, podcast hotline. So we have seen golden goal in the past. We've also seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, silver goal. Right, Mossy? Correct. And the only one at a major tournament was Greece, Czech Republic in the Euro 2004 semis. Greece scored a silver goal to win that match. All right. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's interesting uh, when, when I think about this, because I've told you that I want to go right to penalties. And I've told you that usually when I don't have somebody, uh, you know, a dog in it, I, I, I want the drama of penalties. The, the golden goal thing on paper sounds good, but in practice, when you see it on the field, especially for a sport where you do not ever even have to have the ball to potentially win the game, you can completely seed possession and just get one opportunity and go and counter. Um, and so what that does at times means if and when you do something and implement something like this, Amy, where there is such a... Um, benefit, but there is also such a punishment if for letting in just that one goal, what ends up happening is people tend to be incredibly defensive and even more so than the game lends itself to on a normal basis. So that's, it, it didn't give us the drama that we thought we were going to get. And as a matter of fact, in many instances, it made, made players and made teams act differently than they would if they recognized that even if they let a goal in, there was still the opportunity from a time perspective to claw that back. 
Does that, does that make sense? Yes. And had I been on last Monday's pod, remember, I famously missed it because of travel issues getting to Seattle, but we were coming off a weekend in which three of the four women's Olympic quarterfinals had gone to extra time. I was going to bring up the fact that you don't think there should be extra time. You wanted to go straight to penalties after the 90. Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Go straight to penalties. And that will affect the 90 minutes. And now we're seeing it going to 100 minutes because of extra time and all that kind of other. It will affect the mentality of players and coaches if you know that once that final whistle blows you're going to that situation where a lot of coaches and players feel like they don't have as much control when it comes to the penalty so if you feel like you really are that better team and you struggle and have a weakness when it comes to penalties you're going to do everything you possibly can in that 90 minutes to finish it out but in the U.S.'s case, they won two games in a row by scoring in yeah. uh, extra time. Trinity Robin against Japan, Sophia Smith against if Germany. If it's my team that I'm, that I'm cheering for, obviously it's a good <laughs> thing. But more often than not, I'm watching a game that I have you know, no, no dog. So I'm, I'm just go to, go to the penalties because I, uh, I want that drama. All right, what else we got? All right, next up, a question on X. Jason Wood asks, over the weekend, the NCAA posted individual posts on X highlighting the colleges, the U.S., women's national team players went to, compared to the U.S. men's national team, that's not the case. Debate is always around the path for development. Uh, U.S. women's national team moved the needle for that debate? Um, it's Well, it's not a debate when it comes, I think, well, it's continuing to be a debate when it comes to the women's team, but obviously it's, it's very, very different situations and scenarios. The, the traditional pathway of college when it comes to the women's game still is not just existent, uh, in existence, but is still tried and true and still is incredibly valuable. By the way, I should say Anson Dorrance, who uh, has retired, uh, evidently, congratulations to him when it comes to the women's game and when it comes to the, uh, the the collegiate pathway out there. I think that as we continue to see women's professional soccer grow and the leagues grow, we've talked a lot about this, that pathway, as we've seen in the men's side, will continue to diminish. There'll be fewer pathways and they will become of less and less value as players from a younger age and right after high school, maybe even in high school, turn pro and want to go, uh, want to go that pathway. But, um, I, you know, the, uh, the championing of that pathway by, you know, whoever's involved here and colleges highlighting the fact that they're you, the, that this women's national team is populated by players who have gone through their system. That makes complete sense to me. It's, it's completely gone when it comes to the men's game for the most part. There will be some that, that happen over the, uh, over the years, but there are very, very few players that you see from a men's perspective on the national team that have gone through the collegiate process. And it has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to the point where it's almost non-existent uh, right now. And I can lament it, but it's just the reality of the situ uh, situation. And that probably will be the course for the women's game. It'll take a little bit longer, but that is certainly the way that it is, uh, that it is going. The debate will continue to happen, to your point, Jason, because in our effort to create better soccer players, are we creating better people? Are we creating better Americans, both on the men's and women's side, by having them bypass this experience that I think can help you, not just on the soccer field, but off the soccer field going forward. And does it matter? I don't know. That's part of where the, the, the debate that I enjoy having with people is to how important and significant and how much value do you place in that experience? And I'm not talking about the 90 minutes that you're on the field from a collegiate perspective, but I'm talking about the other 22 and a half hours that you have in a collegiate type of environment. And does that benefit you if and when you decide to stop that collegiate pathway and become pro if you are that good, which we all know is a very small portion? Mossy, anything else on that? Uh, no, but on the topic of college sports, the AP preseason college football poll came out today. In case you're wondering, your wife's beloved Ohio State are number two. Oh, okay. Kyla's beloved Oregon number three. Uh, my beloved Michigan number nine. Uh, Sean and Katz, Tennessee, 15. And USC 23, we've got a whole USC brigade here, Aaron, Gabe, John Marcus and company. So an exciting season on the way. Remember, USC and Oregon are now members of the Big Ten Conference. So Michigan will be playing both of them. That'll make for 
interesting uh, Mondays on this podcast after those games. All right. I didn't listen to a word you said. Do we got any more questions? <laughs> any more questions? Uh, one more on X. Uh, oh, okay. Steve, Steve Malanga. That name rings a bell. I think he's a repeat. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, he asks, a few would argue Malik Tillman has more soccer talent than Gio Reyna, yet Tillman has found a home at a club that values him, is getting plenty of playing time, and his career is advancing. Why is Reyna having such a problem doing the same? Well, I don't think it's because Malik Tillman is doing anything different necessarily. Uh, you have to surround yourself with good people. You have to surround yourself with competent people when it comes to your representation. People that have your not just you know short-term goals, but long-term goals and recognize bigger picture types of things. So I think that's important. Uh, and that, that probably applies to anything in life, surrounding yourself with, uh, with good people. You know, I think when it comes to Gio Reyna, from a very young age, he has been in a kind of a bubble and he has been told that he is good. And let's be honest, he is good, He's incredibly talented. And when things didn't start to work out for him, and things went sideways, which, by the way, happens to every professional at some point in their career. Where, And it could be through, through no fault of your own. It might not be that you actually did anything. all right, Or it could be because of injury. Or it could be because of a coaching change. Or an ownership change. Or any number of things. You have to be spry. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to uproot. You, and you have to be willing and able to rely on people that are going to put you in situations where you are comfortable. I'm not talking about getting out of your comfort zone, where you are comfortable so that you can parlay that into better types of situations. And I think that when it comes to someone like Gio Reyna, undeniable talent. And to your point, Steve, much more talented than a Malik Tillman. But he has not been put in situations that are beneficial to him in terms of his growth growth in terms of his evolution as a player but all is not lost because I do think that he can find a place and if and when he does I think that he will flourish will he become everything that we think he can be maybe maybe not doesn't always work out but you know so far has not been a, a good couple of years for Gio Reyna I have a feeling he's going to end up sticking around at Dortmund at the end of this transfer window, which, frankly, is what he should have done in January when Nottingham Forest was the only other option out there. He missed out on a chance of going to a Champions League final. And, you know, they've not uh, got a new coach. Terzic has gone. It's now Nuri Shaheen. So it doesn't sound like there are any great options out there. We'll see if anything pops up in the last couple of weeks here of the window. But if not, uh, I suspect Gio will at least start this season uh, back at Borussia Dortmund. Ooh, okay. Well, that would be interesting. You know, right back in the well and see how see how he does. All right, should we get to uh, one to the road? Let's do it. All right, roll it. Roll the van. Roll the van. There's the party van going along. There we go. Uh, one for the road. All right. So I got this this question over there on the uh, on the social media platforms out there about you know rating the summer of soccer and there always seems to be another summer of soccer but this 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 summer of soccer was certainly something to behold just in terms of the sheer number of games obviously from a workload perspective us doing two tournaments at the same time we just got done with the olympics now and all of this wonderful kicking of the ball that has happened um when i think about what this summer of soccer has been and this person had asked me to kind of rate it so i'll do kind of a, B, C, D, school type of thing. Worst thing you can get is an F. Best thing you can get is a A+. Plus. And I'll, I'll separate it out into different entities, teams, groups, when it comes to the characters and the roles that they played in this summer. I think in totality, I thought it was an incredible summer for soccer. I thought the players... The teams, the drama, um, and just the energy and positive energy towards the game w was great and something that we would like to see on a continual basis. And I th certainly think when it comes to 2026, we'll be kicked up to a whole nother level. All right. So when it comes to the U.S. Women's National Team, they get an A. I mean, it's not even a question. We talked about what Emma Hayes has done and what this team has done to completely flip the script and change the the little perception of this team from an American perspective. It could not have gone any better. So they get an A. On the other side, when it comes to the men's team, they get an F. 
And yeah, there are people that will argue that, yes, but they, they fired Burhalter, and so they should get some credit for that. And yeah, they do. But the problem is, is they lost out on an incredible ability to make us believe that we are heading in the right direction. And from a results perspective and the results of those results, it is without a doubt a failure. And failure starts with F. The U.S. men's national team gets an F. When it comes to the U.S. men's Olympic team, obviously getting back to the Olympics for the first time since, what, 2008, um, that was an accomplishment. It gets a little pat on the back, but then you want to see them do well. And yes, getting out of the group, congratulations on doing that, but we still have higher hopes for this team. So they're going to come in at a, a C because... While you got out of the group, really what you did was what Mosky and I were talking about all the time. You beat the teams that you should have, and you lost the team that you shouldn't have in terms of France, and then you got your ass kicked in the knockout rounds against a Morocco team. Good Morocco team, but you didn't even put up a fight. And so you don't get credit for that by any stretch of the imagination. So you get a C. When it comes to Comnable and the organization of Copa America, they get a C. And I know a lot of people are going to talk about the situation that happened in Miami and that absolutely brings down their grade, uh, the, just the ridiculousness and the unnecessarily unnecessary, uh, ridiculousness outside of the stadium, uh, that enveloped that, that situation. And, you know, the field situation was not great fields, but you couple that with some huge, huge crowds, wonderful drama, wonderful excitement. I thought a soccer that while different from the euros was equally as, as compelling, at least to me, so, Comnable, you get a C. And certainly, if the fields had been better, the organization had been better, the security had been better, and Miami doesn't happen, you're getting into the B types of territory. Uh, UEFA gets a B plus for their uh, Euros. I know a lot of people say that this was a boring Euros, but look, the, you know, the, from the fan zones to the excitement on the field and obviously big stars coming through and all of the drama and all that kind of stuff, I thought they did, they did a great job. And we weren't even there. So we're seeing it from, from the outside. Certainly people that were there talked about how exciting it was and how much Germany um, embraced this tournament and how exciting it was and how well organized it was. So they get a B plus. CONCACAF, as a organizer, gets a B. Now, I know they're going to distance themselves from Comnable when it comes to uh, Gold Cup, but this is also CONCACAF, and while the U.S. wasn't great, Canada certainly was, historically great, and so they get credit for, uh, uh, for that. So CONCACAF coming in at a B. USSF, which kind of, again, distanced themselves from everything that goes on. We talked about what the U.S. women did, what the U.S. men did, so they're going to come in at a solid B. The IOC, I thought, well, both the women, men's and women's Olympic soccer were, were good. I think the IOC in general, there should be the same amount of teams. We talked to Carly Lloyd earlier in this show. Um, that needs to be rectified post-haste. Crowds were not good when it came to uh, a lot of the men's games. So IOC gets a C. MLS, we talked about League's Cup and what they are doing. They get a B, I think. And maybe that can change from one direction to the other, given we're in the round of 16, and we'll see what happens on and off the field when it comes to uh, League's Cup. And then ultimately, the most important thing, and the most important, Greg, yours truly. Who's got two thumbs and has an A+. Plus? This guy right here. I thought I was awesome this summer, as you were, Mossy, as were all of our Fox colleagues when it comes to uh, bringing it to you. So that's my grading of what happened this summer in the summer of soccer. But as I said, when you look at it in totality, just a wonderful summer. I would give it an, a solid A. And I'm sure you would agree with me. Kyla Morris gets an A plus for her work this past summer. But she's just, I mean, it's almost we take it for granted now, you know? Well, she's we cum laude mention, of podcast. Yeah, anyone that follows this pod uh, knows the Monday show is the marquee show. The Wednesday one is secondary. So we've made a change to reflect <laughs> that. Uh, Kyla will now produce Mondays. We've moved Sean to Wednesdays. Yeah. Hopefully he sees the writing on the wall and, you know, just checks out. Alter does what Marta should have done uh, and just checks out. Alter he can go work on the Bear Felica podcast, whatever it's called. <laughs> Uh, and let Kyla do both shows. But yeah, a, lo a lot of changes. Uh, you know, there was a reorg. We no longer work for Cat. 
Uh, you and I are still struggling to process that. I mean, and, yeah, the fact that we are even here is is amazing. But who knows? We could get off here and uh, there, there could be some stuff. But, but we love bringing it to you. And as long as they will let us bring it to you, we will bring you the State of the Union. Anything before we go? Well, yeah, before we started taping today, we were given an absolute bombshell regarding the director chair. We will address that uh, over the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm like, like you said, I'm trying to get an org chart sent to me so I can wrap my little brain around what's we're, happening we're still here still processing behind the scenes, all the changes. Still wonderful quality all over the place uh, when it comes to this. And you won't see it from a production standpoint uh, in terms of a degradation of what we're doing here. But there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes behind these cameras here. All right, anything before we go? That's it. All right, thank you for reviewing and downloading and subscribing and rating and doing all the different things that you do out there, especially when it comes to, uh, what's it called? Uh, YouTube, subscribe, my friends, all right? Uh, smash that button. One-fisted, two-fisted, doesn't matter. Smash that button out there. We'll talk to you again later on this week in, I don't think it's the secondary show. I don't know what you're talking about. Wednesday's cool, too, so come on back for our second show this week. Masi and I will be, uh, will be here on the State of the Union. We love the fact that you join us. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the day.